We're going to move on to our next talk today. Casey is going to talk about running Minix on ARM. And without further ado, let's Casey explain everything. Hi, I thank, thank you for coming and being here. Uh, a few years ago, Andy Tanbaum was here at Keynotes. Uh, who was there at that time? Two or three, a few people there. And, uh, well, I just watched that uh, keynote and I thought that what might be interesting. And uh, later on, there was a little sign note on the jobs uh, posting saying searching for a programmer uh, for the Minix team. First year, I didn't respond because I was busy with other kernel and Android uh, related development. But like one and a half years ago, I decided to try it. So, uh, hence, uh, I'm, that's why I'm giving this talk right now, because I applied for that job. I got it. Uh, this talk is about uh, Minix on ARM, uh, and also a bit about the history of, uh, of Minix, because uh, I need to put it a bit into uh, context. If you have questions, just go ahead, because at the end everybody talks and it just doesn't really uh, ever work. Right, uh, what you see in front is a, is a box running ARM that says Minix on top. Um, some guy in China decided that he had to make hardware called Minix and put it on the box. This is not our stuff, but uh, would be nice to run Minix on it. Right, if you get bored during the speech or the, the talk, go to Minix on ARM, the wiki, try and download Minix, build it, and uh, you might learn something. Right. Um, Half of the 80s, uh, Unix already existed for quite a while, but the Unix war started and there was quite, quite a debate about which sources were uh, uh, permissible to use. At that time, any time bomb said, I want to create an operating system that can be used to teach, so everybody should be able to, to read it. So he created uh, Minix, Mini Unix, in uh, 1987 with a book, Operating System Designs and Implementation. And that went quite um, quite well, that book. Also, a Usenet group was uh, created, compos.minix, that is still, I think, known, I hope, by most of, of you. Um, well, that was the 80s. In the 90s, 91, so three years later only, Linus announces on the, on the Minix uh, uh, news group that he's doing an operating system, nothing big or serious like new. Uh, well, who knows? 992 only, uh, 386 BSD gets um, gets released, and that's also because of this, uh, this Unix wars. Uh, it was only at, ni at that time that, that it was clear which sources were permissible and what needed to be replaced. Um, so if you put it into context, you really see that Minix and in Linux three, four years difference, and we're talking now about 25, 30 years ago. So that's quite an interesting start that they both had around the same uh, same time. Uh, Minix, however, always remained uh, a, a tool uh, for educational purposes, but also with vision. The vision was to be able to teach OS and just keep it simple. And that's why also many people wanted to add functionality to Minix, but that didn't happen because it would not be suitable for the book anymore because you could not be read the code because it would become uh, too, um, too complex. Right, so back to the, the zeros, the year 2000. Around 2005, uh, the focus of Minix changed dra dramatically. Uh, the idea was to make it now a, uh, the target was to make it uh, usable on the resource limited computers and um, focus on the real reliability. Um, at the same time also the code was re-released re under BSD uh, licensed. So we can say that starting from 2005 something different happened. It was still called Minix, the same people were working on it, but it was uh, the purpose uh, changed um, totally. Uh, at that time research started to be doing on uh, reliable computers. How could we uh, create operating systems that would uh, recover from uh, from fatal uh, fatal errors, and think of it like this: if you have a browser and your, your web page doesn't load, you will not nervously restart your browser. You press F5 a few times; it might work with YouTube or whatever. If your browser crashes, you will not restart your X session; you will just restart your browser. And that same analogy can apply to drivers. If your driver crashes, why would a restart of a driver not be enough? Why do I have to 
crash my computer. So uh, that was a bit the, the vision, uh, I think. Um, and then 2008 came, and the uh, European Research Council uh, is an institute that donates money to do research for the, for the good, I think. And uh, a grant was awarded from 2.5 million dollars, uh, euros to do research on really reliable and secure system software. And from there on, a lot of more development of what I'm going to talk to you now is, uh, applies to, to from, from that, um, that era, I would say. So if you look back, starting 2005, a lot of things changed. Uh, the, the goal of Unix changed and also the, the, uh, the licensing, and that, that made a, a difference. Uh, when I joined, uh, Minix 3.2.0 was just released. That is in uh, 2012, February 2012. And it contained a few interesting features, I think, uh, right now. Uh, Kong was a default compiler, which I think doesn't happen yet on uh, Linux, for example. But uh, most of, also, all the features that were implemented in the past during the research are now part of the, of the operating system. So Minix could, could recover from uh, crashing uh, stateless drivers, so many drivers in the system can be separated into drivers that will have a state and those without. Those who doesn't, don't have a state are quite easy to recover from. You just reinitialize the hardware and you'll, you'll be able to, uh, to continue. Some drivers will be harder because you'll... Can you hear me? Is there... <laughs> Sorry. So some drivers will be uh, harder to restart because they contain states. Uh, so the research also get, went in that area. What can we do to recover those drivers? Uh, and that's basically what happened is that you could split uh, the, the code and the, um, the data. That means that you can restart your driver and re get your data back, uh, back again. Another area of research is uh, live updates, where you have a driver, you might know there's a fault in it, and you would like to restart it. You would like to replace it with newer version of the same driver. Then you also need to take over that state information. And uh, a lot of that work actually is based on uh, Clang, because you can uh, instrument your code and know what variables are and, and, and do things like, like that. That live update is not part of uh, 3.2.0. Um, also, a lot of changes were integrated. So, no longer it was a, a small self-written library C, no longer it was LS self-written, but more and more code was imported from NetBSD. Uh, uh, the switch to the L file format. So, uh, I think 2012, uh, when I joined, was already a, a Minix that was uh, not like we know it or knew it, uh, I guess. So what, what does it look like uh, currently? Um, basically, there's, there's a kernel um, process, one single process that will run uh, in the supervised mode and will do really the bare minimum uh, possible, which is uh, IPC, so inter-process calling, uh, low-level interrupts, contact switching, timers, a little bit of startup, but that's, that's it. And um, most of the other features are implemented as normal user processes, j just above which you, uh, what you see, and uh, are separate processes. Uh, even things like uh, virtual memory management is extracted from the kernel, and that poses some interesting challenges, but that's what happened. Process management happens there. <laughs> And uh, drivers also are just normal processes that can do IPC to the, to the kernel. Above that, there's still the NetBSD libc and the, the normal POSIX tools you'll, you'll find. So, um, from a user's perspective, you should not notice too much. That's its meaning uh, below, but... Uh, right, I hope that's clear. Um, so also on startup, you will get like 12 processes, one kernel that gets loaded, and 12 modules, and it will need to do some, some starting of, of those processes before the init can be uh, called. Features, reliability, the re driver restart I already mentioned, ease of code development, because uh, you have those small drivers, it's quite easy to uh, fiddle around with a single driver, copy a file, and just start it, try it, uh, remove it, a bit like kernel modules, but a bit more flexible, I would say. 
And a very interesting feature is that it's a single build system. It's self-contained. So you do a git if you clone, if you follow the, the guides I just posted, you'll see that you just do a git clone of, a, of code and it will, you call a build script that will build your cross compiler, it will build, uh, build all your host tools and, and, and the end will be an image that you can flash. So we, we made some choices there. Um, right, now to ARM, I think. We need that. <laughs> um, why Minix on ARM? Well, the second point is already like Minix didn't make it until to the desktop. It just didn't happen. Linux barely did it. Uh, so on ARM, a lot of more uh, chances are to be made uh, for, uh, for a smaller operating uh, system. Also, embedded hardware uh, 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 could make good use of the features that Minix has, the, the driver restartability and, and things. Um, so in the end, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an effort to make it more appealing to, uh, to people. Um, yeah. The target we choose for, for this is a bigger board XM, which is a board from uh, Texas Instruments uh, that released a, like five, six years ago. They, they did their first uh, release of that board. It contains a uh, OMAP3 uh, 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 system on chip. It's a Cortex A8 RMV7 uh, system with 512 megabytes of, of RAM. Um, it was a nice system to, to target because um, the documentation is good, open, uh, there's a good community around it, uh, and there was an emulator for it also. There's a QMU emulator to emulate that target, which is very nice if you develop low-level code to be able to grab uh, that stuff. So pointing to, uh, to ARM from, from where we were, from an OS perspective, what does it mean? Uh, so we have different color codings here. Uh, the blue things are things that needed to be modified because the kernel is a single thing. Uh, so level, level interrupts, of course. Uh, context switching, that code, the low level assembly code was, was to be changed. Uh, overall, above the li libc and a lot of things were just unmodified. It's all C code. And the, so there's, there's a lot of code that was not modified. The things you see modified blue also uh, above is the virtual memory manager, I'll discuss later. And just driver work, which all are things that you need to do anyway. Uh, but overall, the, the, the changes were not that, uh, not bad for that part of the system. So what you do, you go, you go assembly programming, you do your interrupt uh, handlers and all that stuff. Uh, it's very interesting, but reality is a bit different, I'm afraid. Uh, you have to do a lot of things before you'll, you'll get to, uh, to the a working operating system that's been uh, ported. Uh, of course, cost compilation, which might sound like trivial, but if you come from a system that really was designed to be able to build on the same system and run on the same system, all of a sudden you cannot longer use system headers. You can, there's a lot of things that, that, that happen that, that you'll just have to, to cope uh, with. Uh, stolen from NetBSD. Uh, build system, uh, same story, mostly uh, stolen from uh, NetBSD, how they do their, their stuff. Uh, it's, uh, and it also included uh, importing headers for different data, data types. The kernel and VM I'll discuss later, and, uh, and driver and development. Um, I'll discuss it already. All right. Mix kernel already discussed actually I think yeah so uh, what's interesting to say if you look at uh, the specific parts I mean uh, ARM specific part of uh, of the kernel it's about 3,000 lines of uh, of C code and like 700 lines of assembly code so that's a bit uh, amount of code that that needed to be added and uh, that includes uh, the OMAP specific things like timers and, and things like that. So that's quite quite small, actually, I, I think. It's like a, a normal driver for some, 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 uh, some piece of, uh, of hardware. Um, yeah. More interestingly, uh, because of its history, uh, Minix didn't, did not use page tables at all before, uh, before uh, 3.2.0. Um, 
it uses call something called segments, Intel segments, which they work differently, which I actually don't know exactly how they work. Um, so a, a big part of, of the work to get it working on ARM was implementing page tables, implementing that both for Intel and for, uh, for, uh, for ARM. Uh, so map regions will, is more that we map uh, ELF sections to uh, page tables, so we, we can do that. Uh, most of the time, uh, I spent anyway, was uh, debugging caching issues on ARM because it's complicated and it's uh, really complicated uh, above what you expect. So uh, uh, where I came from, I did uh, kernel development, I did Android development, but some areas you just, you just don't touch. You just, it works already or you call the vendor, I don't know. So it was very interesting to, to work in that area, but it was also quite a... Uh, Reality, like it's it's not it's not that easy. Um, I mean, it's, because it has all those different processes, there's a lot of context switching. Because if you call, a, 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 the, want to do a si simple system call, get time or something, it will. Well, get time is not a good example, but another system call, uh, it will call the kernel and then really do a context switch to the whatever process is in in uh, charge of implementing that that system call and co switch back. So. A, system, a simple system call can cause two context switches to, uh, to happen. While on, on Linux, it will only do one because it will only go to supervised mode and, and go, uh, go back. So we need to do some more work on uh, improving that. Uh, it's both challenging, but on the side also, there's so much work to be done on just getting the, the system to build work properly and have a reproducible result that we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, get to, uh, to that uh, yet. Help is welcome, by the way. Uh, the driver model of Minix is, is interesting, I would say. It uh, matches very well what you do when you do bare bones programming. You will read out stuff, you will wait for your interrupt, and you will continue your stuff. You will not have to take into account that you're in a current, that, that you cannot halt the system. You're just doing one thing, and yeah, the rest of the, the system it doesn't... Uh, doesn't uh, impact that. And uh, that matches pretty well with, uh, with what the Minix drivers do because they are just normal processes. So they are allowed to sleep, they are allowed to do most things that you expect from a normal C, um, C program. So really the model went from uh, deep, imp making sure you understand the hardware uh, using whatever tools we had, a debugger or a Code Compose Studio, uh, to, towards the implementation on Minix was was very straight uh, straightforward. Uh, interestingly enough, also the the driver model is is uh, is really that like if you have different three buses on uh, on your controller on your hardware, Minix will start three processes that just manage one of those buses, and that simplifies the code because you don't have to look back at uh, at anywhere. So that's, uh, that's one thing it does. So a really typical uh, driver, once it has been made to work bare bones, is really, we'll do a, a main loop, handle a request, ask work from the kernel, and uh, wait for an interrupt. Really, just in, uh, somewhere deep in your, in, your, in your code, it will do like, wait for interrupt. And when that ha happens, it will continue a flow. You don't need to uh, return the flow to the main, main process, because nobody else is gonna call you at the same, uh, same time. Uh, of course, there were some missing uh, 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 bus drivers, like IFCRC was unknown to, uh, to, uh, to Minix, and uh, so we had to, uh, to add, uh, add that. No questions so far? Right. Um, so, about a year later, uh, we finally got it all working. Minix 3.2 at one was released, it had like stealth mode uh, ARM support, meaning that the code was in there, but we didn't officially uh, release it. Uh, we didn't felt it was uh, the right time. But it contained uh, uh, support for BigBoard XM, uh, serial MC driver, frame buffer, GPIO, and a few more uh, of those things. And uh, well, we're offered to uh, discover the world or to let the world discover us because it's been really in an attic for quite a while and all of a sudden you've got something that uh, you've been working on and you want to make something out of it. The first idea was like, let's, let's put Minix into space or let's, let's do something like that, a symbolic uh, thing. 
uh, now it's only the world, so no universe, but just the world. <laughs> and uh, to do that, we went to, uh, to Embedded World. Have you ever been there? In Germany, one person, two, a few there. Right. Uh, the sales pitch was, uh, well, we're a BSD license operating system, so we, not GPL, so you can just take it and do whatever you want with it. Small, we had those features of reliability, and the best of the both worlds approach where we said, well, you've got a whole POSIX user land, and, uh, but um, the kernel is, uh, is not monolithic, so you, can, you have the ease of, um, of, um, of development. And we pitched that, we just talked to people like what do you think of this? Right. So now I'm going to show a movie of uh, our outside this uh, embedded world. Hi, I'm Andy Sander. And here at Embedded World 2013, I'm going to give you a demonstration of the free fall power operator system. Next time, I'm going to give you a more of the arm of the hard desk that they process the line. Now, you can artificially inject falls in the framework of the fire by using the slide and the version of the slide. So, now I'm going to press the button. So that was really fun to be uh, to be there with Andy Tannenbaum and people really interested in in meeting him also and uh, things like, like that. Uh, we also had a, a, a sign saying crash our driver, pick an egg, and people would be able to crash our drivers. They could pick an egg, but also the driver would, would restart. I've got the same demo here actually running. It's uh, doing the same thing, so if you want later you can uh, press it or we can I, I can... I can see if I can switch. Uh, yeah, yeah. No. Let me just continue like that. I might continue the demo uh, later. So what did we, did we discover at, uh, at Embedded World? We were actually, I, I thought I knew what Embedded developed. Yes, sorry? You mentioned about injecting errors in your driver. What, are we talking about hardware errors? What kind of code what kind of can you inject in your, your driver? All right, so I'll, I'll still go to the demo then. Uh, so this is uh, the demo. This is uh, if I press on the button, it will start counting here. Uh, stop it, and it's going to inject faults. So what kind of faults can we can we see? Keyboard errors, which doesn't <laughs> apply. Right, well, I'm just going to see you see a few of those things here. It says, like, um, it will randomly stop the process and increase the program counter, which is quite nasty, I would say. It inserts some beef uh, different uh, errors in the, in the memory. Um, it replaces some instructions with maps. And actually, here what you see is really uh, the, the frame buffer driver, which is a driver that's running uh, here, that's displaying, really gets uh, a page fault uh, to, uh, to cope with and crashes. Uh, and uh, after that, it just restarts uh, itself uh, immediately. Restarting is not per se the, the always the best thing to do. Sometimes you will just take, uh, well, if it's a train that is driving and some error occurs, you might just want to stop at all. Could be. But sometimes you want to, to restart. It's just detecting that there's an error is already quite a achievement somehow. So that kind of errors. Does that answer your question? Kind of. <laughs> yes? One question concerning the demo. The uh, 
lamp is blinking quite uh, irregularly. Uh, yes. Uh, a reason for that? It's uh, it, that's it, it's a technical reason, yes, because we didn't touch the demo since the, the embed world, and it just this this is a demo. This uh, and the same thing. The screen you will see that sometimes it goes faster, it goes uh, goes slower. It's not really a, a problem of the the port uh, the port itself. It's not fast. That's one thing that that uh, could improve, I would say, uh, because if you compare the x86 uh, Minix to the to Linux or something, it is slower, but it's not. And bearable, and here there's still work to do uh, to uh, to make it faster, and it's mainly the context switching that needs to uh, to be improved. Right, let's try to restart the presentation. Right, so we went to uh, a bad world, and uh, uh, we expected like the competition. What's the competition of Linux? I don't know. I would say Linux because that's all I've seen uh, so far. It was not at all like that. If you go to Embedded World, you discover that, that, that many people you talk to don't know Linux. So who you're talking to, you're talking to people who are used to uh, developing ver for very small devices, doing hard real time, and they're either open source or ask a shit lot of money, a lot of money, sorry, uh, for, uh, for what they do. Um, from free to, to, to very expensive. Uh, many just run a microcontroller. Some will do. Will run. On, will be able to run multiple threads of a single process, but still will not will not do proper uh, uh, detection of, of of error, or it will all run in a single address uh, address space. Uh, and then there's the entry of Linux in that in that market. Uh, it's still not a good sell, uh, I think, because. Uh, it, has, it hasn't got that feature that you can certify how long it's going to take to do something. So it, it's hard to sell Linux, but also Linux was not hard to was hard to sell actually in that area. People want either a very simple microcontroller. That was our conclusion, without the external memory, without those features, because it's 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 easy. It's cost down. It's, 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 it's you can prove it works. And the higher you go in the full chain, the, the harder it gets. Uh, interestingly, if you go higher, you start to go into uh, using other hardware FPGAs or using virtualization, right? Again, it gets possible to run a, a full OS, but do the real-time part uh, on a different core or a, a different part of the hardware. So that's what we uh, we discovered uh, there. So we didn't have uh, match clients after that uh, embedded world. Still, it was quite uh, uh, awesome to, to be there and to uh, to learn about all that stuff. So after that, um, last year or something, that was a year ago, um, we currently are just working just on real, uh, relatively features are already part of, uh, of, of Linux. So what are we working on right now? We're just trying to integrate as much code as possible from NetBSD and get this base port working. Uh, we port it to uh, the BeagleBone black and white. You know them or not, those are quite uh, nice boards, especially the big one, one white is very nice development board. And uh, we try to increase community uh, involvement. And that means that externalizing uh, mailing lists, uh, we have a uh, Jenkins setup, Garrett setup, so people, we can do open code review. Uh, we got our first external committer, uh, official uh, committer um, um, there. Uh, Thomas Kort, who did also Google Summer of Code with us uh, on, on porting to the to the ARM. So that's uh, the kind of things that uh, we're currently uh, targeting. Uh, I mentioned already, like uh, well, currently it's still still self-contained system. You just clone it. You run the tool, and what outputs is really a single binary that will work on the different um, boards. That's uh, the current status uh, of it. Um, for the bigger board, we support MMC, the frame buffer, GPIO, power management, a few more things. Uh, more completely is, is listed on the um, on the website, but um, 
we're mainly focusing currently on the, on the bigger bone uh, black. With a bigger board already, you could create an opening system doing something useful. We've got GPIO, we've got, we can access a screen, you can already create small embedded devices uh, without too much uh, hassle. And it's a bit of a difference from Linux because you would be tempted to write a driver quite, uh, quite soon actually, because it's easy. Um, we're currently uh, continuing work to integrate, that means some more NetBSD type alignment, so we have all kinds of 16-bits timers or other things that we removed in favor of 32 bits or 64 bits uh, values, and that, that causes quite some, some headaches, so that's the, the work we're currently uh, working on. More clone goodness, memory map uh, is implemented, and uh, we're moving towards a more open organization. Uh, what I would like to see um, in terms of hardware, I would like to support like uh, more the Texas Instrument hardware, like uh, uh, support for the programmable read-on units, because I think that makes it uh, more suitable for uh, uh, real-time products. And I would like a second port to uh, something like an Albiner uh, CPU, uh, because those are cheap and not well documented. Um, that concludes my talk. Uh, I've, I've not done much, uh, let's say, um, the port has, well, was done in two and a half years, one and a half years, two and a half years, uh, and so many people worked on it. Ben Grass worked on, on it from 2005, uh, has been on part of the Linux team, Linux on just uh, one and a half years ago. Thomas Fehrman did the frame buffer driver. Aaron Thomas did the initial work for the ARM port, and Thomas Coyle was a good summer of code uh, student. Feel free to ask uh, questions. Or not. <laughs> Did anybody get it, get it working? Yes? How do you cope with drama latency if you put them into the Ethernet? Okay, sorry, can you repeat? How do you cope with drama latency if you have a context switch back to Ethernet if you run your dramas in the Ethernet? Right, so the, the question is how do we cope with uh, latency of the driver because we have to switch back to uh, to Ethernet? <laughs> Um, it's hard to say. There are so uh, the question is: is, is uh, does uh, contact switching or uh, increased latency? Yes, it does. Uh, I think uh, reliability comes at a cost. But we've seen on the x86 part at least right now that uh, it's not a factor or two that 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 makes it uh, two times slower than Linux. So I think it is a non uh, non issue right now. Have we done? Uh, yes. Yes, in the back? In your, in your chart of all the embedded OSs on microcontrollers and, and ARMs, so where do you position headaches? Uh, yeah, I would like to put it somewhere on the map. Um, the question is where do you put Linux um, in there? Uh, at first, I, I, uh, when I started, I, I, I expected to be in the, in the part of where you have an ARM. MPU because I mean Linux is a bit smaller, it's more tweakable. You have less, you have more to tweak, and it's a smaller OS. So I would expect to to be have an entry in that in that area, but that area is really saturated with uh, with either on the left side you have a library kind of operating system where you just include a bit of code there and. Uh, uh, the commercial thing. So, uh, Minix, uh, I, I see it still more on the ARM and, and support it with some hardware. So, with FPGA or uh, program ball retirement unit, I think is a nice place to to uh, to be.
and yet you don't support any of the useful ARM features that would speed up the context switching like AC. So you, you have to use your TLBs on each fucking context switch. So do you have any plan to fix that? that, that if you're targeting smaller ARMs, you really have to do that. Uh, it is very high on the wish list. <laughs> uh, but currently, uh, there are no direct, direct plans. As soon as we have time to do something at that area, we will do it. But currently, uh, the work that's happening is on uh, aligning with, Net, uh, with NetBSD to be able to uh, integrate all the boring code, all the libraries, all programs to be able to, to get those one running. Because if we have fast context switching but no applications, it's not such a good sales pitch either. I would advocate for concentrating on, on getting something that is good enough and robust and fast <coughs> before adding uh, new tons of features. So uh, the suggestion was to make it fast first, and uh, I'll take that into account. <laughs> Thank you. Yes? Uh, well, there are other uh, microkernel based operating systems, including open source ones. Right, so the question is, uh, you're a microkernel-based operating system, why don't you go together with all the other microkernel-based operating system and uh, get all together, get along to your, uh, yeah. Um, there's a uh, microkernel uh, the room uh, at Fostem, so people are talking together uh, about that stuff. Um, um, we research, uh, we actually in, have implemented two things in the last three years. Uh, one was called DDE Kit, which comes from the Dresden University, which is an uh, OS abstraction for things like threads, uh, memory access, um, all the things that every driver needs. And a few drivers were written on that. Um, so that's currently how we've got our USB support is through those interfaces implemented and then even using uh, for USB for support we're using the, the Linux uh, stack. Um, it's still a lot of work. Um, so uh, currently our, our biggest chances of uh, driver development are, are following RUMP, uh, which is NetBSD's way of running kernels, kernel drivers in, in user space. And we're investigating uh, that. Um, yeah. But if you look at the chart, uh, uh, if, if we currently we're, we're focusing on the bigger bone black, and we've got enough drivers for it to do something useful. USB is what we're working on to, because we want to be able to make a small NAS appliance or something, uh, something like that. So we don't currently don't feel much need to do to do that. But it's a waste of, of effort to do that for everybody. Yes? Yeah. You say you focus on the bigger bone, um, but uh, despite this choice, you have to make some choices in the, in the code, so um, how can you formalize it? And I use different targets in the bigger bone, and I work on many times, right? So I have to remove some stuff you have done specifically for bigger bone, and I make the titles. So do you plan to extract this bigger bone specific? Yes, of course. Uh, so the question is, I'm, um, we're mainly focusing on TI hardware currently, and uh, adding support for a different architecture uh, poses problems because we're not there yet in terms of uh, some make files or some drivers sometimes make assumptions on the, on the OMAP. Uh, being able to, to cope with that uh, means either following the Linux approach of doing the device tree, following a device specific hardware and making your kernel cope with that, uh, or uh, look at NetBSD again uh, for their, their way of configuring the kernel. And uh, both of, uh, of those uh, require more work than we currently have. So currently we're, we're, we're waiting for the next platform to make it more generic. So come with your problems and we'll fix it. <laughs> Any technical questions? Thank you very much.